I'm going down to the river, gonna wash my soul again. I've been running with that devil, no, he's not my friend. I've been far by the wayside, living in this world of sin. I'm going down to the river, gonna wash my soul again. I'm going down to the river, gonna bury my head in the creek. Gonna jump in that water, gonna baptize both of my feet. Cause everywhere I'm walking, I'm getting to the trouble deep. I'm going down to the river, gonna wash my soul again. This old world's going to hell in a handbasket. I don't get some resurrection soon. Come in and up in a casket.
unexplainable I, I can hardly think as you call me Deeper still as you call me Deeper still as you call me Deeper still to love, love, love You're a good, good father It's who you are It's who you are it's who you are, I'm loved by you. It's who I am, it's who I am, it's who I am. You're a good, good father. It's who you are, it's who you are, it's who you are, and I'm loved by you. It's who I am, it's who I am, it's who I am. same old road for miles and miles you've been hearing the same old voice tell the same old lies and if you're trying to fill the same old holes inside there's a better life there's a better life you got pain he's a pain taker you feel lost, he's a way maker. You need freedom, saving, he's a prison shaking savior. You got chains, he's a chain breaker. We've all searched the light of day in the dead of night. We've all found. First Christian Church. Uh, it's so good to be here this morning worshiping our God together. Um, as the children find their way to Miss Jillian and go to children's worship, I invite you to stand and let's get our praise on. we 
done for you a couple of times as a special, and now we're going to sing it as a congregation. <laughs> of you know that God does not cause all things, but God can cause all things to work for good. Amen. There have been a lot of things that we would rather have avoided over these last couple of weeks, wouldn't you say so? Of course. But it's been amazing both the way that this community of faith has been strengthened around one another, the witness of this community of faith in the greater Washington area. I've heard through social media, I've had phone calls, I've heard by word of mouth just what an extraordinary faith community this is and think about even for many of you I, I can certainly say my firsthand experience the way that we've grown in community with our neighbors we had our very next door neighbors under the house and bringing equipment stuff that we didn't have and then there were some things I could do be able to pick up some things and help them with some of the heavy lifting and it was interesting because just a couple of days ago we went from being associates neighbors in the neighborhood only to text messages ending with we love you God does not cause all things, but God can cause all things to work for good. The cross is a perfect symbol of that. God did not cause the crucifixion, but God can cause that crucifixion to turn out for good. As we sang just a moment ago, those words that are so profoundly true will never be separated from God's love, no matter what we're going through. I said to a number of people, this morning when they asked how I'm doing I said I'm glad to be here and by here I meant right here in this place on this Sunday morning we don't have to gather as a community of faith on Sunday mornings we don't have to be 
in this place. God is in all places in all times. There's nowhere we're going to go where we're not going to be in the presence of God. But it is a powerful, extraordinary privilege that we can gather. And when we gather as people of faith, it is unique. We see God in the sunsets, of course. We hear God in the laughter of a loved one. We see God in the eyes and in the smiles of others. But there really is something special about when we gather as people of faith, united in our recognition of God's love for us, united in our recognition that we really are children of God, united in our desire to draw closer to God and to draw closer to one another. What a special privilege it is that we are here by divine appointment. And I say this frequently because I want us to recognize it. God knew that you were going to sit in the very seat that you're sitting in this morning. God knows what you are concerned about. God knows where you feel a little insecure. God knows your deepest hunger and longing. God knows our hearts better than we know our own hearts. God knows our minds better than we know our own minds. Whatever it is that's troubling us, whatever it is that we're concerned about, God's already there. God's already ahead of us. I'm hearing these words even as I speak them. God is our all in all, and God desires to meet every need. With that in mind, let's go to God in prayer together. Gracious God, we are so very privileged to be in this space, gathered as your people, with the recognition that you are worthy of our worship and our praise. We've all been through somewhat of a scare these past few days. And as concerned as we've been for ourselves and for our families, your love is so evident. Your agape, God love, is so evident within us. Because in the midst of our own concerns about ourselves and those who are closest to us, we've also been so very concerned about our friends and neighbors, our family of faith, those in this Washington community, but our hearts our prayers, our minds have been on those who were less fortunate than we. And our minds are still there. We know that there are people without power. We know that there are people who have been displaced with no sight of when they're going to be able to return to their homes. There are some who will be unemployed. There are some who have lost property and possessions, and still there are some who have lost those who are most precious to them. Property be, can be replaced. And so our hearts and our minds and our prayers go out to them. We pray that our prayers would not be empty prayers. We pray for that peace that surpasses all understanding, not with lip service, not as a religious platitude, but as the reality of your eternal love and the peace that your love encompasses. In the days ahead, as many put their lives back in order and get back to some way that is familiar, we ask that we would continue to draw closer to you and to one another that our faith would be strengthened, that our love would grow, that our love would continue to grow beyond sentiment and how we feel, but that we would reach out to our brothers and sisters with sacrificial love. This morning we know that we are here with the needs that you meet on a daily basis. We do pray for our daily bread but we also pray for that bread that satisfies the spirit. We're here because many of us perhaps feel displaced, not from a physical home, but spiritually. 
show us the way home. Some of us are here because we're experiencing grief. We're praying from, for the balm of your Holy Spirit, your healing presence. Some of us are here needing wisdom and direction. And we know, as Brother James taught us, that if any of us are lacking in wisdom, we can ask for it, and you give generously to all. We recognize that wisdom is your will and your way. So for those of us who are seeking wisdom, we're asking for your will and your way. We are finite, but you are infinite. We have limited knowledge, but you are omniscient. And so we're confessing our limitations and inviting you to direct us. We pray that you will meet every need of every person gathered here in the way that only you can. In our uncertainties, give us peace. Where you have given us direction, give us resolve. Where we're feeling uncertain, give us hope from our relationship with you. And above all, fill our hearts our minds, our spirits with your love. The love that your son embodied. The one he witnessed to. The one he was willing to go to any length to demonstrate. The one we call Savior. The one we call Lord. The one we call Christ. The one we call brother. The one we call friend the one we call teacher because he taught us to pray when he said our father who art in heaven hallowed be thy name thy kingdom come thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. I invite those who are serving to come forward. Just a couple of words of instruction. We have a lot of guests here, and we're always so grateful for our guests. We're grateful for those of you who are here every Sunday. Many of us, there is no place we would rather be, right, Miriam? Right. Than right here. <laughs> but some of us are here for the first time and may not know what's about to happen, we as the Christian Church Disciples of Christ, and it's not because of our denomination, it's something that we celebrate. We celebrate communion. We celebrate the length to which God will go to demonstrate God's love. It is a mystery, ultimately, something that we will never fully comprehend, but that's the reason we've been given symbols, tangible symbols, to remind us that God, the transcendent one, entered into the human condition, the human form. That Jesus emptied himself of any will apart from God the Father, God the Mother, God the Creator, God the source of all that is, the nurturer, the compassionate one. That's who God is. And Jesus was willing to do whatever was necessary to carry out God's will. And it was God's will that love would be perfected. And I emphasize this point often because it bears repeating because many of us, I believe, this is my opinion, we can have that discussion, come see me, we'll discuss it. Many of us have been taught that God desired the crucifixion. I don't believe that. God desired perfect love, and perfect love in a fallen world leads to crucifixion. That's the reason Jesus says, take up your cross and follow me. Love. No matter what the consequence, it may not lead and likely won't lead to a literal cross. But we're all called to sacrificial love. And I'm thinking of Ray. We had an elders meeting and often have quoted Mother Teresa who said, give until it hurts. But there's something about giving till it hurts that all of a sudden feels good. Because God's presence is there, God's love is there. And that's that paradoxical nature of so many aspects of our reality where it seems like opposites, but 
There's a truth in what appears to be opposites, like the cross. It reveals perfect love, and yet it was a violent death. When we give until it hurts, we experience God's presence because it is love that is growing. And so we have an opportunity to participate, to receive communion and take that kind of love into ourselves. The life of God, the presence of God. We are nurtured and fed and nourished with the spiritual presence of God. And then we have an opportunity in that same way. We are not paying for communion. There are some offering baskets. But we can give of our resources with a couple of things in mind that God really is the source and that helps keep things in perspective for some of us on a weekly basis on a daily basis there's some of us that are going through financial hardships and even offering at least once a week gives us an opportunity to recognize whoa 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 whoa, wait a minute we're not the source of our lives we don't have to count on our limited resources whether they be mental or or wisdom, how we're going to figure this out. God is the source of all in our, of everything in our lives. And so when we give, we recognize who that source is. And when we give sacrificially, we are participating in the presence of God. And then our other offering, in addition to communion and our tithes and offerings, is we have a prayer station. And there are times when we recognize that we are the ones, as the song says, that are standing in the need of prayer. If you're needing prayer and would like someone to pray with you, we have a station with a Christ candle lit in the center. And we are reminded that Christ, the light of the world, shines in the darkness. And the darkness, no matter how dark, will never, ever overcome the light. are with those people who still can't get to their churches. Their homes are destroyed. There's water in their homes. And they can't get there. They can't get to the place they like to be to participate in communion. But what we know is that when Jesus met with those disciples in that upper room, and when he shared bread and wine with them, what he really wanted, what he really wanted was for them to feel his love and then to take that love and go out into the world and share it. And that's what we know has happened for so many who right now are living in such trouble. They've been com given communion on a daily basis. Now, people who are acting as, as, as your disciples, they're giving them the bread of life. They're sharing with them living water. They're giving them hope. They're supporting them with love. And so as we come here today, let's remember that as we, as we take this bread and as we drink this symbol of your, your blood, that it's for us to be your disciples and show your love in the world. Amen. Amen. On that night in the upper room with his disciples, being aware that he was getting ready to face his deepest challenge of his ministry on earth, aware that those disciples, many would scatter, that one would betray him, even though he had promised to follow him even to the point of death. But Jesus, being the great teacher, wanted them to remember he wanted them to remember, so he took a loaf of bread, and after he'd given thanks, he broke it. And he said, take, eat. This is my body given for you. As often as you partake of this bread, do so in remembrance of me. Remember me. And then in the same way, he took the cup also. And he said, this cup represents our eternal covenant. I will always love you. I will always have you. You will never be separated from my love. As often as you partake of this wine, this new and eternal covenant, do so in remembrance of me. 
These are the gifts of God for every one of us, the children of God. Thanks be to God. You're invited to come forward or to go to our other stations as you feel so led.
more than just the talent, which is so evident, there's a soulfulness that comes through them that ushers us right into the presence of God. We are now picking up with the second part of our series of growing into our true identity, growing into our true identity. I believe that is one of the great purposes for our very being. Why we were created is so that we can grow into our true identity. And part of the reason we want to grow into our true identity is that is the source of meaning in our lives. It is the source of purposefulness. It is the source of our wholeness. It is the source of our integration. For many of us, we go through life in conflict, even within ourselves. We are disintegrated even within ourselves. And as we grow into our true identity, there is a wholeness that is restored. I am going to cover briefly some of the ground that we covered in our first part of this four-part series, because I know that there are a number of people who could not be present that Sunday, as well as a number of guests with us. And I will do that briefly for the long-winded preacher. I will do that briefly. I will do my best. But we are to grow into our true identity. And I, I selected those words very carefully and very precisely. I say our true identity because we are created as persons. God knows each one of us personally, but I often refer to us as persons rather than as individuals because I want us to see that we really are persons in community. We are not separated. We are distinct, but we are inseparable. For those of us that recognize that we are a part of the family of God, we often refer to the understanding of us as a community of faith as we are the body of Christ. We are one body with many members. When one part suffers, all parts suffer. When one part rejoices, all parts rejoice. We are distinct but inseparable. God loves each one of us personally and God loves all of us corporately. I often understand my particular calling is to foster personal growth and corporate growth. What do I mean by that? Foster the personal growth of each person who is here, but strengthen all of us collectively so that we will have a greater unified witness, that we will have one witness, part of that one agenda, that we would be one, even in our distinctiveness. But we are persons in community. We are not separate from the community, and yet the community does not solely define us. We do have our distinctiveness. And next week, we're going to see part of what that distinctiveness is all about when we look at offering our God-given gifts to the church and the world. So we are growing in our true identity. So what is our true identity? I've heard this past week on a couple of occasions songs that there was one, Valerie and I happened to be in the car together, and it was something about being human and only human. And she said, I bet you love this song, don't you? Well, because it goes to a theological point, and a theological point is our understanding of God, how we understand God and how we understand ourselves in relation to God. And we hear this kind of thing reinforced all the time. Well, I'm only human. I heard sometimes say, well, it's just part of that human disease. It's just that human disease. What does it mean to be human? Our true identity is that we are created in the image of God. That is our true identity. That is the ultimate reality about ourselves. That is the truth about ourselves. That is our human nature. Our nature is that we have been created by God and in the image of God. Now, one of the distinctions that we recognize is that there is also a human condition. And one of the reasons we are growing into our true identity is because we are growing out of that which is not our true identity. Whatever condition is apart from our true condition, we want to leave behind. And that's part of what we're going to talk about today. We're going to release some hindrances that would prevent us from growing into our true identity. And one thing we need to release is the false conception about our true identity. Once we recognize that we are children of God, when we act, and we all do, you will before this day is over, whether you are aware of it or not. Whenever we act contrary to the will of God, we are not acting according to who we truly are. We're acting in a way that is separate from our true identity. And we want to grow into our true identity. Anytime we act in accordance to the will of God, 
we are acting in accordance with our true identity because that is who we truly are. So we're trying to recondition ourselves. Christianity is a dynamic faith in two senses of the word. It's dynamic in the sense that it is powerful. Dynamic, like dynamite. It is powerful to recognize who you are. But it's dynamic also in the sense that it's not static. We are in the process of ongoing transformation. It is my sincere prayer that I am not today who I was yesterday, and I will not be tomorrow who I am today. I want to continue to grow. Some people take pride early on in the study of theology. Some of the theologians, the people who really think and give their lives to thinking through faith so that they can share those insights with others. One of the criterions of whether or not it was a good theologian is whether or not they had had the same understanding of God from their early days to the end of their life. And I thought, what a strange criterion. You would hope that it would be transformed over time, that your insights would differ at the end of a life spent considering and reflecting and trying to understand and gain new insights to God. You would hope at the end of your life you'd be a different person than when you first started. Wouldn't you agree? So we are in the process of transformation. And we are growing into our true identity, and our condition is changing. And so we have often said, and this is so very important, our thoughts lead to our words, lead to our actions, lead to our habits, lead to our character, leads to our destiny. We could replace destiny with condition. We are changing our thoughts about who we truly are so that we can grow into our true identity, that our condition through our thoughts, words, actions, habits, character, now we have grown into our true identity. Is everybody with me so far? If we are going to do that, so this is where we ended last week, or a couple of weeks ago, everything we do will be grounded in love. If we are going to grow into our true identity, everything we do is grounded in love. Those who do not know love do not know God, for God is love, the writer of 1 John says. And see what love, look at chapter 3, verse 1, I'm quoting now. See what love that God the Father has lavished upon us that we should be called children of God, and that is what we are. Those are the words of the writer of 1 John. That is what we are, that we are children of God. Then look at 1 John, that's the little, there are three little epistles at the end as you're headed to Revelation. 1 John, not the Gospel of John. Chapter 4, verses 7 and 8. Those who do not know love do not know God, for God is love. So in other words, no matter what you say you believe, no matter what your denomination, if you don't know love, I don't care what you call it, you don't know God, because God is love. And everything we do then if we're going to grow into our true identity, is going to be grounded in that reality. Everybody with me? Everything's going to be grounded in that reality. So that as we grow in love, we are growing in God. As we grow in love, we are growing in our true identity. And one of the more important aspects of this growth is coming to know what love is. Because the word God is the word God. And everyone in this room has assigned meanings to that word. And how many of you know that there is a God that is independent of our understanding of that God? Who God is does not require our full understanding. There is a reality that is God that transcends what we have assigned to that word God. Is everybody with me? Was that confusing? We assign meaning to words. We assign meaning to that word God. And so that's the reason we have to grow in our understanding, in our knowledge of the reality that that word God points to. Is this clear? Okay. I'm not saying that it's all that brilliant. I'm just realizing it could be slightly confusing. In the same way, then, love. We assign meaning to that word love 
But the ultimate reality, which is the ultimate reality, which is love, transcends our limited understanding of that reality that we use the word love for. And so the way that we grow into our true identity is certainly grounded in love, and if it's grounded in love, then growing in the knowledge and understanding of what love really is. Because there are a number of us, all of us, have a finite understanding of what love is, and so we want to continue to grow in the knowledge and understanding of what love is, because as we do, we grow in the knowledge and understanding of who God is. And as we do, love is that meta value, as the theologian Timothy Jackson says. And I repeat it because it's so beautiful. And I love to be reminded of it. We need to be reminded of it. It is that meta value, it is the supreme value apart from which we have access to no other value. Apart from love, there is no true peace. Apart from love, there is no true joy. Apart from love, there is no true justice. With love, now you do have access to all other goods. Without love, you have access to no other good. With love, you have access to every other good because love is all-encompassing. So as we grow in love, we're growing in peace. We're growing in wholeness. We're growing in joy because that is the source, the ultimate reality, the source of all that is. So this week, we are moving to releasing any hindrances that would prevent us from growing into our true identity. So let's look. I could have used and started to a dozen passages, but I thought we would just stick with this particular passage because it highlights a number of things as we're going to release those hindrances. This is Philippians chapter 3. We're beginning in verse 4b and continuing on. If anyone else has reason to be confident in the flesh, Paul is saying, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day, a member of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew born of Hebrews, as to the law of Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. Let's just pause here. One of the things we're going to have to do if we're going to grow into our true identity is we are going to have to release identities other than Christian as primary. Any other identity that is primary other than Christian needs to be released. Now, what do I mean when I say Christian? I'm not speaking necessarily of a religious tradition. I'm certainly not speaking of a denomination. Christian means Christ-like. Before we ever became a religion, People who were not Christian would point to people who lived in certain, a certain way. They would point to them and say, there go those Christians. Those people whose lives are shaped in such a way that it was distinctive. Those people were different. They loved one another. They took care of one another. They loved even their enemies. They refused to engage in violence. If they needed to, they would sell their possessions and give them away and give them to someone who was in need. If there was an outbreak, a sickness that would break out in a community, when everyone else fled, they would run to that community and take care of people. Those Christians would do that. One of the things we're going to have to do is to make our Christian, Christ-like identity supreme. That is our supreme identity. Look at how Paul once understood himself. As from a particular religious tradition circumcised on the eighth day, a member of the people of Israel, his nationality. Some of us are more American than we are Christian. And it always gets quiet when I say that. We are more Christian than we are American, and if we're not, we need to make that our supreme understanding of who we are, our true identity. Now I'm really going to get in myself in trouble. This is not politics, what I'm getting ready to say. Many of you are cringing already. How many of you know that evangelism and church growth are not necessarily the same thing? Telling the good news of God's love is not always the immediate recipe for church growth. They say, don't say anything divisive. It's not intended to be divisive, I assure you. If there was someone of another nationality that were desperate for their family to cross a border. What is our supreme identity? Is it American or is it Christian? P- 
People say, well, you've got to obey the law of the land. Well, let me ask you this. Do we follow God's law? Or do we follow the law of the land? And if it comes into conflict, what do we do? What's God's law? Love the Lord your God with all of your heart, mind, soul, and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus said, love your enemies and you will be perfect. We're not even talking about enemies sometimes. We're talking about people of another nationality. Now, some of you, I know you're upset with me and those of you who are concerned about other things, but I would not be a faithful minister if I didn't say what I just said. Now, that's my conviction. You can, that's another thing about disciples now. You can disagree with me, and many of you do, and that's okay. And that's part of our oneness, isn't it? Oneness is not sameness. All right. So not our nationality, the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin. Our family lineage is not our primary identity. A Hebrew born of Hebrews. Our religious tradition, our race. A Hebrew, born of Ray, a Hebrew born of Hebrews. And as to the law of Pharisee, our denomination, our religious tradition, our nationality, our family lineage, our race, and our denomination cannot be our primary identity if we're going to grow into our true identity. Paul recognizes he has to release those things as he's growing into his true identity. So let's move on, verse 6. As to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness righteousness under the law, blameless. Yet whatever gains I had, these I have come to regard as loss because of Christ. More than that, I regard everything as loss because of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. One of the things we're going to have to do is release fruitless pursuits, ultimately futile pursuits, Many of us are not even aware of it, and we're engaged in futile pursuits, ultimately. Some of us come to that realization earlier in life, that we're giving all this energy to something, and all this time, and all this sacrifice to something that doesn't really matter. And related to this is there's a disposition change. You see a disposition change. There was a time that Paul was concerned about his identity apart from his identity as a Christian his religious tradition, his nationality, his race, his pursuit then of being found righteous according to the law. His whole disposition changed. Now he wants to be found in Christ. And I love this because I've begun to see this even during these days of the hurricane. There are a number of people that do a number of different things, but it's their ministry that they see it as. Where's Lee Latham? Lee has a particular job, but his vocation is so much more than his job. I needed him and was able to call him, and he has a specialization that I don't have. That's a ministry that he provides. He gathered up some other people, and we now have in our storage room some ready-made meals for people when they may be in need of it, and people showing up on a Saturday morning to make sure that those pallets are here. That is a ministry There was a time early on in my vocation, and and I still have to rely on other people, but there was an accountant at a particular church where I served, and it was his ministry because he said he knows how much anxiety people have around their finances and their taxes, and that was his ministry. Whatever we do, whatever we pursue, it's not primarily about us. Now, it gives us fulfillment when we're doing what God has called us to do, and we're going to see that next week, but it's not primarily about us. We've all been called to make a contribution. And even our spirituality. We don't have to be right before God with those things we do. Some of us are trying so hard to be right with God. There was a time in my life when I was looking at my past, and we're going to look at this in just a few moments. I was looking at my past, and I was wondering, what could I ever do that I could be right with God? Because I had made a mess of it, and I'd done some bad things. And how many of you know when you do some things, it's not just your life that is affected? You always leave a wake of it when we act in certain ways. Now, for some of us, they're saying, well, good Lord, I don't want to come to church and have him pounce on me. This is the good news. 
you are forgiven. You are right before God. God loves you. You don't have to get right before you're right with God. God wants you to get right so that you can experience that grace. Paul says, I want to be found in Christ. I want to be found in the unconditional love of God. Not a righteousness that comes by my own struggling and striving according to these practices of a law. Once we are embraced and once we embrace the love and grace of God, then we are transformed not because we're trying to get right with God, but because of God's love we cannot help ourselves. That's the other side of grace that is so exciting to me. This is the beautiful side of grace. Grace is the absolutely unconditional, unmerited love of God. We will do nothing to earn more of God's love. We will do nothing to lose God's love. That is God's grace. And people say, well, then what do you do then? Why do anything if God's grace is going to cover it all? Because you cannot help yourself. When the grace of God gets on the side of you, it's always motivating you and challenging you. That is the spirit and grace of God that will accept you where you are but will not leave you where you are. When you get a hold of that grace and that grace gets a hold of you, you want to be another person. You want to grow into your true identity. You're not resisting it anymore. If anything, you're resisting going back to who you used to be. And that too is grace. You're not earning it, but there is an effort. That inspiration inspires effort, and there is a distinction between earning something and providing effort towards something. Do you see how that works? Paul says, God's grace to me was not in vain. I worked harder than the rest, yet not I, but the grace of God within me. The grace of God inspired him to work harder than the rest. So there's a disposition change where I'm not pursuing things because of how it will reflect on me. How many of us? I've been there. There was a time in my life that I was pursuing things because I wanted people to think certain things of me. Right? You will get to the point, now this is the interesting thing. We can get to the point to where we will do things that are not in line with how we perceive ourselves, and yet it is no less, it is not contrary to our true identity. Well, what does he mean by that? Let's take me, for example. If y'all want me to dress in a certain way, I'll come in here and dress that way. If y'all want me to wear flip-flops, I'll wear flip-flops next Sunday. In shorts, I'll do that. I'll wear a t-shirt. If another group wants me to put on a robe, I'll do that. Do I identify with any of those things? No. Is that contrary to my true identity? No, because what is my identity? To grow as a Christian. And I've been, in, uh, been given a particular calling, which has nothing to do with what I wear, but if there's a particular group that's listening that needs me to look a certain way, I'll do that. It has nothing to do with my identity. Are we with one another? So it's not about us, although it includes us. It's a dispositional change. Now he wants to be found in Christ. We're going to have to let go of our comfort zones. For time's sake, let's jump to verse 10. I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the sharing of his sufferings by becoming like him in his death. We're going to have to transcend our comfort zones. That's one of the hardest ones, isn't it? It is part of the human condition, not nature, human condition to pursue pleasure and avoid pain. That's part of the human condition. If we are going to grow into our true identity, we're going to have to transcend our comfort zone in a lot of ways. But for many of us, that is one of our great hindrances. I'm not comfortable with that. I'm not comfortable doing that. Now, I do a lot of things, but don't ask me to do it. I'm, I'm just not comfortable with that. We have to transcend our comfort zones. Now, I want to reiterate, I said this during our communion time. It says, I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the sharing of his sufferings by becoming like him in his death. I want to reiterate, God does not desire our suffering. God does not desire violent death. God does not desire persecution. God does not desire that we would be victims. God desires that we would witness to perfect love. And I want to say this, too, for those of you who have not heard me say this, because this bears repeating as well. This does not mean that we remain in situations that are abusive. This is not what this means. My true identity is that I am a child of God. Your true identity is that you are a child of God. 
if I am abusing you, the child of God in you has a right to resist anyone who would try to diminish the child of God in you. We have a responsibility to do so, and that's even an act of love for the abuser. To recognize the child of God in them says, you are acting contrary to your own true nature, and I am not going to cooperate with that. Are you with me? We resist that. God does not desire suffering. God will suffer in order to end suffering. God was willing to suffer to end suffering. God gets no pleasure out of suffering. God gets pleasure out of love. And so God is willing to love to the point of suffering to end suffering. God doesn't enjoy crucifixion. God wants to end crucifixion. God doesn't enjoy sacrifice. God wants to end sacrifice. And we are willing to love till it hurts so that we won't have to hurt at some point, that we can witness to the love of God in a way that evokes the love of God in the child of God of the other. That's why nonviolent movements work in a moral, relatively moral society. When someone will challenge and confront someone, take a blow and not hit back, it evokes the humanity in the other. God does not desire that the person who received the blow would suffer. God desires that humanity would be evoked in the other. Are you with me? But we're going to have to transcend our comfort zone. And then for time's sake, we're going to have to release a pre preoccupation with the past. We're going to have to release a preoccupation with the past. For some of us, we are hanging on to something that has happened back there personally, for us personally. Either something we did or something someone else did in the way that has been an injury to us. This is akin to saying forgiving ourselves and forgiving others. And for those of you who have been here, I've often said, no, this is important for us to recognize. Forgiveness is a decision. It is an act of the will before it is an act of the emotions. People say, I'm trying to forgive, I just can't. That's not true. You make a decision to forgive. It's an act of the will. One of the greatest ways is to continue to pray for the person who has injured you or if it's yourself, continue to pray about that matter for yourself. But you make a decision, I'm going to forgive. If you will do that habitually over time, your emotions will catch up. Forgiveness is not a matter of how we feel any more than love is how we feel. Love is an act of the will. It is what we do. It is the decision we make. Sometimes we have to break with the past. And then I'm going to close on this, and I don't know who this one is for. This is not one of those you're going to blow up balloons and run out and celebrate kind of closing points, but it's important. There was a person that came to my office. I happened to be in Atlanta at the time. There was a person who came to my office off the street, and we were in a busy road, and that happened occasionally, and they needed someone to speak to. And I'm, I'm not actually a counselor in that regard, but I was happy to listen and, and re reply. But there was a woman who had come in, and her son had died in his 20s, maybe a few years past. And she had been to various therapies, and she disclosed this to me. She had been to various therapies and counselors and Christian counselors and that kind of thing, and she was just struggling to let go of the grief. She was carrying this deep sadness and grief. And I didn't know what to say. And I prayed, because I hadn't been trained, and I still haven't been trained. I prayed, I said, God, whatever you would help me to say to her, whatever words you would give to me. And then this insight came that I believe was an insight from God for her in this moment. This may be for one of you, it may not, I don't know. She was afraid, and I said this, you're afraid of releasing the grief because you think in releasing the grief, you're releasing the person. And that's not true. You will always have that person with you. You will always have that love with you but you don't have to hold on to the grief. You're not letting go of the person. You're just beginning to let go of the grief. Some of you may be here this morning who are still carrying a lot of grief, and you think that by carrying that grief, that's the only way to hold on to that person, and it's not true. You can release that grief, and you can be assured. And again, this is not a platitude. Hear me now. I'm telling you the truth. Nothing, neither height, nor depth, nor things to come, nor things past, nor angels, nor powers, nor life, 
nor death, nothing in all creation can separate us from the love of God revealed in Christ Jesus. We are never, therefore, separated from one another. We are always connected to our loved ones, whether physically or spiritually. This life or life beyond our imagining, we will never be separated from God and from one another. My prayer for us this morning is that we will continue to grow into our true identity. We are children of God. That is who we are. That everything we will do is grounded in love because God is love. And we're going to make a commitment today that we're going to release anything that would hinder us from growing into our true identity. Amen. If there's anyone here who has never made a confession of faith, you are, you are confessing that Jesus is the Son of God. That that is what we are as children of God. Jesus is the Son of God. We are children of God. We're going to follow Jesus as the one who saves us, sets us free from our false identity. Do you see how that works? By claiming him, we're going to grow into his identity, which is our true identity, and we're being set free from our false identity. That's a confession of faith we're making. If you would like to be a member of a community of faith, this is a community of faith committed to growing into our true identity. Transcends denomination, transcends religious tradition, transcends party affiliation, transcends nationality. We are Christians. Personally and corporately, that's what it means to be a part of this particular faith we call First Christian Church of Washington. If there's anyone here who would like to renew your commitment in a public way, you're welcome to come forward. However God is calling you to respond, I invite you to do so as we sing our hymn of invitation. I invite you to stand as you're able.
my privilege to introduce Joe and Lucy to you all. They are joining us by transfer of membership. They've been coming for the last several weeks and have found in here a welcoming and loving family of faith, and those two are welcoming and loving as well, so they fit right in. You already know that. So we are so grateful that you have joined us. I'm going to go ahead and say this too, and this is in no way to diminish because we so celebrate this. I know that there are several of you that want to join. Never feel like when someone comes down, you're stealing thunder. We'll celebrate all of you, and you would have made room for them, wouldn't you? You would have celebrated. <laughs> I know you <laughs> they do fit right in my goodness I know you're going to want to greet them in just a few moments but let us go and go with our benediction and now may the love of God that surpasses all understanding the love who is God the love that is our true identity as children of God the love that is the source of our all in all our peace our healing our joy truly our all in all may that love guard and sustain our hearts this day and forevermore amen, amen. that was great Brother, sister.